Welcome to TV, Tennessee Valley Church. This week, we are in the sanctuary of the First Baptist Church of Huntsville. Three mornings ago, I saw the following headline and read the article. Ted Wilson, an eternal optimist and former Salt Lake City mayor, dies at 84. Now, I didn't know Ted Wilson, but it did make me think about optimism. Jim Collins wrote that popular leadership and management book titled, Good to Great. In that book, Collins wrote about Admiral Jim Stockdale, who was one of the many U.S. soldiers in the Hanoi Hilton, the infamous prisoner of war camp during the Vietnam War. Collins spent some time with Admiral Stockdale, and as they walked along, the Admiral walked with a pronounced limp, the result of repeated tortures. Finally, Collins asked, asked the Admiral about the POW camp. Who didn't make it out? Well, that's easy, answered the Admiral. The optimists. The optimists, Collins asked, that didn't seem to make sense. Yes, the optimists, Admiral Stockdale continued. They were the ones who said, we're going to be out by Christmas. And Christmas would come and go. Then they'd say, oh, we're going to be out by Easter, and Easter would come and go. And then Thanksgiving, and, and then it would be Easter again. And they died of a broken heart. The optimists, said Stockdale, didn't make it. Some of us once were optimistic about God. We, we heard the stories of God delivering Daniel from the lions and of God parting the Red Sea for Moses and of God guiding the stone from David's sling to kill the giant Goliath. And, and so we weren't afraid of threats or obstacles or challenges. We believed God would take care of things for us. We were optimists, perhaps even naively so. But then something happened. Maybe our parents split up or a relationship went sour. A church disappointed us. We lost a job or someone we loved. Maybe we prayed for something that didn't happen. And we began to wonder if all those claims about God's power and love were, were perhaps overstatements, exaggerations, like those optimistic prisoners of war of which Admiral Stockdale wrote, some of us have experienced spiritually broken hearts. Let's face it, some of us are disappointed with God. My experience says that we respond to this disappointment with God in, in three possible ways. One, we decide to expect nothing from God. We figure that if we don't expect anything much from God, well, we won't be disappointed. Well, that's a wrong response. Two, we blame ourselves. If I just had more faith, or if I were just a better person, God would answer all my prayers the way I want Him to. We tell ourselves, well, that's a wrong response too. Or three, we come to learn as our faith matures to have realistic expectations. It is that third option that is the biblical option. That third option is the option of strong and lasting faith. Realistic expectations. To help us understand this, let's hear from 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 through 9. Therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. Barbara Brown Taylor wrote that some people feel betrayed by God, for they feel like He broke His promise to them. Their Sunday school teachers, when they were small, implied that if they would do right, God would take care of them. And they did the best they could, but God didn't seem to live up to His end of the bargain. They obeyed their parents and tried not to behave badly in school and so on, but one day when they needed to cash in their chips, as it were, when they needed God to step up and either get them out of trouble or prevent trouble, God seemed disinterested. As an example, Taylor quoted a friend of hers whose infant daughter had died. And he said, the father said, I don't know what to believe anymore. 
I don't know whom to pray to or what to pray. I tried to be a good person. I did the best I knew how, and it didn't do a bit of good. If God is going to let something like this happen, then what's the use of believing at all? This grieving father, Brown wrote, had become disillusioned. God hadn't come through like he thought God would, and the father was disillusioned. God doesn't always live up to our expectations, and that results in disillusionment. Yet Brown makes a great point, I think. Disillusionment is not all bad. Disillusionment, by, definitions, by definition, means the loss of our illusions. Disillusioned. And if God doesn't live up to our expectations, then the problem lies with our expectations, our illusions, not God. It's a hard thing to realize that we have mistaken our illusions for the truth, but it's a good and healthy thing. A mature faith simply has realistic expectations. So what are realistic expectations? Well, let's look at the Bible. On the one hand, Elijah prayed for the widow's son who was so ill he had stopped breathing and the boy was revived. On the other hand, David prayed and fasted and cried for seven days while his own son was ill and his son died. On the one hand, an angel appeared before Peter in prison on the night before he was to be brought to trial for his public proclamations of Jesus. The chains fell off and the angel escorted Peter untouched out of the prison. On the other hand, Stephen was stoned to death for his commitment to Jesus. On the one hand, Paul was bitten by a poisonous snake on the island of Malta and God prevented the venom from taking Paul's life. On the other hand, in the text we're reading today, Paul prayed for deliverance from his thorn in the flesh and it didn't happen. And those things are not just in the Bible. You and I have heard people we know speak of miraculous intervention by God into their most dire situations. Many of us could tell a story about how something mystical, something beyond explanation has happened when it seemed like God did a real live miracle in our lives. And yet we also know lots of stories and, and we have lots of our own stories of times when we fully expected God to do something that he frankly didn't do those stories of someone for whom we prayed and yet they died, those stories of praying for jobs we didn't get, those stories of pain we can't seem to shake, of thorns in the flesh, if you will, that just don't go away. Sometimes God still exercises His unlimited power and He performs what we call miracles. And yet sometimes He who is all wise as well as all powerful still chooses not to intervene, at least not in the ways we can see. Understanding that helps with realistic expectations. Let's go back to the Bible. Here are some people who demonstrated mature faith and realistic expectations. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego declared, King Nebuchadnezzar, you can throw us into the furnace if you want to. We believe God is able to save us from it. But even if he does not, O king, we want you to know that we will worship no God other than the true God. Habakkuk declared, Though the fig tree does not bud and there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, Though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, still I will rejoice in God my Savior. Paul wrote, I prayed for the removal of that thorn in the flesh. We don't know what that thorn was, by the way. It could have been a physical illness, such as a severe eye problem. It could have been an inability to speak well, or his opponents, or any number of things. We just don't know. Paul continued, what I got from God was, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. So I've decided to be glad for my weakness so that Christ's power may rest on me. The appropriate and mature response then to our disappointments is the choice, the willful, sometimes difficult choice to believe God is who he says he is, even, even if he does not meet our expectations. 
the appropriate and mature response to our disappointments is the choice, the intentional hard choice to trust God with all our hearts and to lean not on our own understandings. Now, please don't let me talk you out of believing in a miracle. That would be a failure of communication on my part. I'm simply inviting you to a faith that prays that God will deliver the thorns in our flesh, that believes God can do so and even hopes He will do so. And yet, a faith that doesn't crumble if instead God chooses to say, my grace is sufficient for you. That is a realistic expectation. When I come back, I'm going to tell you the story that I always remember when I hear that wonderful phrase, my grace is sufficient for you. Jesus, you're my heart's first love, and you've been holding on to me. You once were the air I breathed. Still my heart to remember Jesus I am wandering But you're chasing after me You once gave your life for me Still my soul to remember still my soul to remember your oceans wave without thinking your mountains rise without knowing your rivers run without needing to know You're literally spinning so free Oh, they're happy to be So teach me this kind of humility Teach me this kind of humility children need a safe, comfortable place to lay their heads at night. Sleep in Heavenly Peace is a volunteer organization that builds beds for kiddos in Madison County. 
Mary Ena Heath is the chapter president, and we appreciate you being here Thank today. Thank you. I'm so glad you asked me. Travis is talking today about realistic expectations. Mm -hmm. And some of these children, families, I'm sure they could use a, a new house mm -hmm. to live in. Hey. We can't, most of us can't do that. But one thing we can do is help these children have a bed to sleep in. That's right. We try to give them that special space. And it is so important to them when you see a child get into a bed of his own or her own the first time, they just sometimes get in it in the middle of the day and they say, this is my bed. You know, I'm so excited. I mean, they are so excited to have their space. Sometimes they even climb under it. You know, it's just <laughs> something nice for them uh, to have of on their own. So many of us take for granted. Right. It's a hidden problem. I mean, we don't usually ask, uh, do you have a bed? I mean, there's a lot of assumption there. Lots of times people don't even discover even with the kids that they're working with, that the kids don't have beds. So we, uh, I talked to a, um, a preschool teach, uh, director and said, we'll be happy to, because we volunteer with them. And I said, do you, we'd be happy to help them with you with any of your kids that need beds. And she said, oh, thanks, but I think we're good. She called me back in about four days and said, I had no idea. Mm. And we have uh, provided 17 beds to that group and their siblings since then. So, And this is important for physical health, the yeah. mental health of a child, right. learning when they go to school. Yes. And uh, one mother sent me a picture the next day of her two boys in a bunk bed still asleep. And she said, well, they missed the alarm, but it's okay. Uh, you know, you just don't know what, what what they're dealing with and how much exhaustion they have just from trying to... Sometimes, you know, a child is on the couch where TV's being watched, where the whole family's there, and they don't really get away. When they can get away into their own bed, they're going to get a better night's sleep, and then they're going to perform better the next day. This is something that could be team building. Mm -hmm. It could be a family event. That's right. It's, it, from what I hear, <coughs> foolproof. Mm -hmm. you, there's a basic way to build these beds. There is. There's a wonderful, magnificent system. And every time we have engineers come, they're just in awe. They, they, they study the process and say, we can't really improve on this, you know, but we have, it, it's a sort of a um, assembly line for making the headboards and footboards, for making the side rails and for making the slats. And then there's also s uh, dipping uh, because we dip it in a solution that helps prevent bed, bed bugs. And then we also brand with the SHP brand and that's kind of fun to do too. So it, it really is foolproof, but you get to work with power tools. <laughs> so. That's a draw for a lot of people. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and I'm sure you've heard so many just stories of people yes. so appreciative of these. And that's so true. Just uh, this week, um, one of our delivery teams delivered a bu uh, bunk beds. And th right after they left, the dad texted me and said, um, please tell me when the next bed, bed build is. I want to work and show my appreciation. This is not a strictly Christian organization, but there are a lot of Christians that participate. It's important to them. And we uh, are a praying chapter. And so we pray before every build and we pray over those beds and over the children and the families that receive them. And I think it's important too for us to remember that um, we're not the saviors that come in and, and swoop in and deliver beds and fix everything because we all know there is one savior who handles that. And we're all broken. The brokenness just looks different for, for some of us. So we really try to keep that in mind as we serve these kids and their families too. We just want to be the hands and feet of Christ. Oh, Mary, you know, we really appreciate you being here. Yeah, Sleep in you. heavenly peace, something that we can realistically do yes. to help a child. Yes. Thank you. You're welcome. We've been talking about Corinthians 12 and that powerful promise from God to Paul. My grace is enough for you. When I hear that, I always think of the following story. Chris Backert is a really good, though much younger, friend to me. Years ago, Chris knew that I was hurting. Our church in another city had been rocked by a really difficult and public personnel failure. I had had to make a hard and costly leadership decision. Chris asked to meet me for prayer. 
We met at a picturesque spot on the James River in Richmond, Virginia, called the Pony Pasture. We had talked a while when Chris said, I think I have a word from the Lord for you. Let me pause for a moment and tell you something about Chris. On three occasions, I've heard him pause before a sentence and say something like, I believe the next words are from the Lord. And I believe they indeed have been. It doesn't happen often. When it does happen, however, it's a great blessing. I think I have a word from the Lord for you, Chris said. And he continued, God is going to say to you, my grace is sufficient for you. That's it, I asked Chris. I expected something a little more dramatic, more exciting, something that would, in fact, solve my problem. But that was it. God is going to say to you, my grace is sufficient for you. So I started listening for those words. I kept expecting God to whisper the words, perhaps even audibly, my grace is sufficient for you. Nothing. Chris would email, call, or text, and I'd always report, he hasn't told me yet. And then, weeks later, on a Sunday morning, God's Spirit seemed to be blessing us with an unusual awareness of His presence in our worship service. It had been a rough stretch following that painful personnel issue I mentioned. And this Sunday morning, worship was one of those rare, mystical, refreshing, mountaintop-esque experiences. I had my eyes closed, though I don't often do that. I had stopped singing and was just enjoying the worship experience. I was unaware, and I know it sounds crazy, but I was unaware even of the particular song we were singing. I knew we were singing, but the song wasn't registering. I was just carried away by the sense of what was happening in the room. And then I opened my eyes. At that moment, for the first time, I realized the song that the congregation was singing. It was on the screen and echoing in the room. Your grace is enough. Your grace is enough. Your grace is enough for me. I began to weep to the point that I began to worry that I was not going to be able to compose myself before I stood to speak in a few minutes. I was overwhelmed. And I had this mystical sense that God was whispering to me in that moment, this is my message to you. I texted Chris after the service. God told me today, I said, the creator of the universe, the one who spoke the universe into being, finally whispered to my spirit, my grace is enough for you. Now, I don't know your pain or grief or anxiety. And I would, I would set you up for an unrealistic expectation if I were to say, it's all going to work out beautifully. So I can't say that. But I can say to you with all confidence, the grace of God, the unconditional, undeserved, unlimited, unrelenting love of the one who breathed life into you is higher and wider and deeper than whatever the source of your pain is. His grace is not only amazing, it is enough.
We hope you're enjoying TV Church, and we have a request for you. Would you consider hosting a group of friends in your home to watch TV Church together? You could serve snacks or have people bring elements of a meal to eat together. You could gather and watch live at 10 a.m. Sunday mornings on Way TV, or you could record it on TV and watch it together anytime. You could watch together from your computer at tvchurch.online anytime. You don't have to be some kind of expert. You just need to like people. And on top of that, you can invite people you like. People you like who are not part of a church family. We at TV Church would provide you suggested discussion questions. So you could watch together, discuss what you've seen, and then maybe eat together. Or you could snack as you watch. There will be no obligation to First Baptist Church of Huntsville. We produce TV Church, but you don't have to be a part of us to host this in your home. This is just an effort to take the church with a capital C where people are. You could be a part of someone's significant, holistic, eternal transformation right there in your home. Would you be willing to consider being a host? Email Pastor Travis at Travis at FBCHSV.org. He will get you on the email list to receive discussion questions for the week. Would you consider that?